Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 46. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's Laura Reagan, LCSWC, with today's episode. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash therapy chat. Julie Diazavedo hanks PhD, LCSW, is a licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist, founder and director of Wasatch Family Therapy, and author of The Burnout Cure and The Assertiveness Guide for Women. Julie is a blogger, local and national media contributor, online influencer, consultant, and award-winning performing songwriter. I'm super excited to have Julie Hanks on Therapy Chat today. She has been a practice-building consultant guru for me, and for so many therapists, she's taught us about how to expand our message to a broader audience. I certainly wouldn't be a podcaster without the encouragement of seeing what Julie has done, and we talk about that a little bit in this episode. You can find Dr. Julie Hanks on social media at Dr. Julie Hanks. She's on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Google+, Facebook, LinkedIn, and you can basically find everything she's doing at www.drjuliehanks.com. In today's episode, we'll be talking about Julie's new book, The Assertiveness Guide for Women, which just came out in August 2016. I had the chance to read a preview copy of this book, and it's really great. I love Julie's book because she not only talks about how to be more assertive, but where these issues with speaking up for ourselves start and how to overcome the underlying issues. Anybody who's done therapy with me or talked to me much knows that I am all about what's really going on underneath. And so that's why I love this book. Let's get started listening to my interview with Dr. Julie Hanks. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I am really excited about this episode and what you're going to hear. I have a special guest with me. My guest today is Dr. Julie D'Azevedo Hanks, who is the author of The Assertiveness Guide for Women and a therapist and someone who teaches all of us therapists tons of stuff. So I'm super, super excited for you to hear from Julie and what she has to say today. Julie, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat. Thank you, Laura. I'm excited to, uh, to talk with you. I'm really happy. I'm so excited. Your book just came out on August 1st. So we're recording this just a few days after it came out. And I was thrilled to be able to get uh, an advanced copy so I could check it out before it even came out. And it's wonderful. It's such a needed resource. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, definitely. So for anyone who's listening who might not really know you and your work, can you just kind of start off telling us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do? Yeah, so I'm I'm licensed as a clinical social worker, and I've been in practice for over 20 years. Uh, I own some therapy clinics in Utah, Wasatch Family Therapy. And over time, uh, I've also evolved into a private practice consultant, helping therapists build their, uh, their businesses, their online practice, adding clinicians, uh, and getting media interviews. And I've loved, loved that. Uh, and then also over the past probably 10 years, I really felt a, a call to to the media and um, just kind of, and social media. And so I've been learning as much as I can and building an online presence and uh, becoming a content creator. And, um, and that's actually how the, the opportunity to write this book came along. The publisher, New Harbinger, asked me if they could publish my next book. So I was thrilled. And um, so that's how this book, this book came about. Uh, I'm, I'm retired uh, from seeing, actually seeing individual 
clients at this point, and I just I do a lot of training and uh, management of the business, you know, part of the practice. Wow. Everything you just said about your consulting for helping therapists grow their private practices is, you know, definitely touches my heart because you were the first person I came across um, in the online world who was talking about how to build a private practice. And I really, I learned a ton just from your blog and your website, and then joined your Facebook group for therapists. And I mean, what I understand about how to basically be an entrepreneur, I, I started learning from what you were doing. And so, I oh, mean, wow, that's thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad I, that just makes me happy because I I want to be a resource for other therapists and, you know, for the general public too. But thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I just, in, in case some therapists are listening, just direct people to privatepracticetoolbox.net? Yeah, please. And, and then, and rockthemediaschool.com. So those are some resources for, uh, for therapists and practice building and media presence kind of stuff. So yeah, I have, I, I have my, uh, I have a variety of interests and endeavors, (laughs) which keeps life interesting. I know. In fact, there's one we didn't mention that we should briefly say something about is that you have a whole life as a musician too. (laughs) Yeah, I'm a performing songwriter and have recorded and produced 10 or so CDs, albums through the years. So yeah. Wow. You're a very inspirational person because you, I've watched you over the past few years um, as a mother and going back to school to get a PhD and then publishing your first book. And now I think this is your second book, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just such an inspiration because, you know, you can do it and you're teaching us how to do it. And it's wonderful. So you're helping so many people even without doing direct client work anymore. Yeah, that that's kind of where I felt called more like to use broader platforms to reach more people. And so that's, that's really why I uh, stopped doing clinical work about a, a year and a half ago. And it's, it's, that was really hard <laughs> to decide to do because I love my clients and I love clinical practice, but it felt like the right thing for me. Yeah, I'm sure that was a hard decision. Well, I'm really glad that you have focused on, at least for this book, um, assertiveness for women. And your book is called The Assertiveness Guide for Women, How to Communicate Your Needs, Set Healthy Boundaries, and transform your relationships. And immediately, even when I heard the title, I thought, I know so many people who would benefit from this book, I would benefit from reading this book. And as I started reading it, it was even better than I expected. So, oh, yay, yay. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure it's going to be a huge hit. And, you know, probably already has started to be I'd like if you can for you to talk a bit about your book. And um, first of all, what made you decide to focus on that subject? Yeah, I have worked primarily with women for 15 years. And I, assertiveness is really something that, that most women struggle with. Mm-hmm. And what I've noticed in my, in my practice was that a lot of women don't assert themselves because they don't really know how they think, what they feel, what they want, and what they need. Because we've been socialized to to be aware of those things in other people, and and so, and we're kind of leaving ourselves out of that uh, equation. And so, when you think of assertiveness, you think of you know words, saying something in, in a powerful way. But I wanted this book to be a lot more comprehensive and include like how do you even know what you need to be assertive about. Because I, that was a struggle for a lot of my clients. That's a great point. Because I remember when I first heard, uh, you know, in the counseling realm, I first heard someone use the term boundaries. And I was like, well, what does that really mean? And then when they explained it, I thought, I still don't get it what that means. <laughs> and that's when I realized that I needed to look at my own boundaries and figure out what what do I want them to be? What, what feels right for me? What doesn't? And, you know, it's, it's like, I never thought about that. What Mm -hmm. do you mean? Like, I can, 
I can have. I can set my own boundaries. <laughs> what? Right. Mind blown right there. Yeah. So I wanted this to be more than just here's what to say, but more of a way to approach life so that women are confident and in saying and asking for what they what they want and need. Uh, because in my own personal journey, that process has been so important. And the more that confident I feel in my self-awareness and self-knowledge, the more confidently I can set boundaries and I can take a stand for things that are important to me. And I can do it in a way that's that also respects other people. Yeah. Some people are afraid that if they are assertive, it means they have to trample on someone else. Right. And assertiveness has, has, is often associated with um, actually like being aggressive. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's, it's being strong and compassionate, strong and aware of others. And so I think that's really important to, to dispel that myth that assertiveness means you know, pushy or witchy or, um, yeah, just not nice. And, you know, sometimes assertiveness isn't nice if it's, if it's a really pressing issue, but, you know, I, I, assertiveness is just really expressing your feelings, thoughts, needs, and wants and respecting other people's differences. That's it. Wow. Sounds simple. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So one of the things that really grabbed me when I started reading your book is that you talk about attachment and how that relates to being able to be assertive. So can you talk about that more for Mm -hmm. our audience? Yeah. Yeah. So I often use an attachment lens in my clinical practice and in my just in my life when I stumbled across attachment theory, you know, this was 25 years ago or so as an undergrad, I thought, oh, this, this makes so much sense that our early relationships set this template for how we engage in relationships throughout our life. And again, this is not set in stone, but uh, attachment, there's kind of a general attachment style that we learn And uh, it's pretty consistent throughout life unless we make a concerted effort to to shift it through therapy uh, or or other means. So in the book, I talk about three general attachment styles, and those are anxious, avoidant, and secure. And it's it's important to understand that these are not judgments or negative. It's just like, okay, let's understand what you're bringing into your current life. So then you, you can uh, really hone in on what the barriers are for you with assertiveness. So, for example, with an anxious style, uh, someone with an anxious attachment style is going to tend to want to be closer in relationships than the other person. Um, they might often feel overwhelmed by emotion and not able to separate kind of what do I think from what do I feel? It's kind of like all intense and mixed, mixed up together. And so how that, how that impacts assertiveness is if you're, you know, if you're afraid of, of being uh, abandoned or separated and you're clinging to a relationship, you may not want to speak up because you fear creating distance or rejection in the relationship. And so there might be more of a tendency to please Mm -hmm. and to kind of let the other person get what they want. Um, And, you know, that can be, (laughs) that's a problem, right? It can't just go one way. And so anxious people will often hold back, hold back. And then once they can't hold back anymore, just kind of blow, (laughs) you know, let let it all out at once. So um, that's a barrier for the anxious attachment style. Then on the other end of the continuum is avoidant. And an avoidant style, uh, a person with an avoidant style tends to want to be uh, less close than other people. So if it's, t- if it's emotionally too close, it's like, eh, I'm not interested in that. Um, they tend to say things like, I, you know, I just let things roll off my back. I don't let, you know, I don't let things 
bother me. They tend to be more like I'm level-headed. Uh, so a, a barrier for that style is that they're often detached from their emotions, especially during times of stress. It's just like, oh, no, I'm good. But really, there's emotion going on about the situation. They're just detached from it. And so that is a barrier because if you're not aware of what you're thinking and feeling and wanting and needing, you you can't express it. <laughs> right. So, um, so for the avoidant style, you know, part of the um, the trick in in developing assertiveness is to learn how to connect with your internal experience, so you can access that information and and then share it in your relationships. And then secure is kind of in the uh, I look at that as kind of in the middle of this continuum. Uh, and everyone has versions of this at different times. So this is not set in stone again. But secure, generally secure people can form relationships. They can be close and they can also be alone. They can spend time alone or they can be without a relationship for a while. And it's it, they're okay. Um, they're able to effectively manage emotions. And they can separate their thoughts and their feelings. They're pretty clear, like, what the difference is between a thought and a feeling. Um, and so bar barriers for a secure attachment style would be just skill building, um, being able to accurately label more emotions, being able to, uh, you know, have tools, ways to say things and, and skills that will help them be more effective in their assertiveness. So that's a kind of a quick overview of how attachment styles impact our ability to assert ourselves. Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. And I know in the book, and this is one thing I love about it, you have exercises to help people assess where they are, and also how to be more self reflective with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, we mentioned earlier that we think about assertiveness as words, but I break assertiveness into five skill sets. And only one of them has to do with words. <laughs> and so, you know, people might be expecting this to just be about like, here's what to say in this situation. And it's not that although there is some of that. So the five skills of assertiveness that I focus on in this book are self reflection. So that's being able to look at the past, understand your attachment style and your family relationship template and your level of differentiation. And so that's, that is the first one. The second one is self-awareness. So that's an awareness of what's going on right now. What am I thinking and feeling right now? What do I want and need right now? And then the third one has to do with self-soothing. Uh, or emotional management. And so for an anxious person, that's how do I calm myself down so I can articulate what I think, feel, want, and need. And for an avoidance style, it's more how do I connect with that, with those emotions, so I can effectively express what I need. Um, and then the fourth one is self-expression. So that's actually what to say, how to say it, where to say it, how to set up a situation where it'll be the most likely that you'll be heard and responded to. And then the fifth skill is self-expansion. And I make a case in the book that really the point of assertiveness is to expand ourselves, to, to let other people teach us uh, how to enlarge our point of view and to develop compassion. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a lot broader uh, than, than just here's the words to say. Yeah. And that's really important because you could just tell people the words to say, but if they don't really know what's going on inside, it's not going to be effective. Right. And if they can't manage emotions, either connect to them or calm themselves down, then they're, they're not going to have, they're not going to have the impact that they hope to have. Right. And they may even have a negative experience of using trying out some words and then being flooded with emotions that they can't handle once the person doesn't react the way they want them to. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, 
There's a concept you mentioned that I know what it is, but I'm not sure that everyone who's listening knows, and that is differentiation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Just kind of let people know what it is and how it matters. Yeah. So differentiation of self is is an important concept throughout the book. And, and I suggest that assertiveness is part of differentiation of self. And differentia- differentiation of self, the definition of that is the ability to be a unique person and stay connected to others. So it's managing that tension of individu- individuality and connection to to other people and being part of, part of a group. And so different families have can tolerate different levels of differentiation before they go into you know high levels of anxiety. And there's a broad range of that. Some families really support uh, children in kind of ex- their own self-expression and, and individuality and others will punish kids for kind of coloring outside the lines of their family rules. And uh, so that's kind of a basic overview of differentiation of self. And one common misunderstanding is that people who are, you know, I'm a rock, I'm an island, I don't need anybody else, that that's differentiation. That's actually not differentiation. That is still a meshment, kind of too close because in order to be an individual, they have to separate from the and disconnect from the relationships. So that's actually a low level of differentiation. Um, d- yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it it, se- it seems like they're being really independent, but really because they can't handle the they can't tolerate the relationship, they are completely shutting themselves us- right. off from the other people. Right. And it looks independent, but it's, it's often uh, uh, not <laughs> because what's lacking is, is being willing to enter that tension of self and others. They just, I'm just myself. That's it. There's yeah. no, there's You're no, just avoiding it. Right. There's not a connection, uh, a close connection with others. Okay, thank you for explaining all that. This, I mean, this is so interesting with family dynamics, family of origin issues that seem to really influence so much about how we relate in the world. And and like you said, through an attachment lens, we know that that is very true. Mm-hmm. Those early relationships. And let me, for people who end up, uh, you know, looking at buying the book. Um, if, if you tend toward an avoidance style, you will not like the, the first several exercises in the book that ask you to think about your past because another aspect of, of an avoidant attachment style is kind of diminishing the impact of the past. Like, what does that have to do with me now? That was then, this is now. And so that will be a cue to your attachment style by how you, uh, engage with the exercises relating to what's in your in your history. So in other words, if people start reading, and they get to that point and become really uncomfortable, rather than saying, Oh, forget it, this isn't the book for me, they that means they need to really keep on reading so they can get through it and figure it out. Right, right. And then some people will just kind of go through the exercises and write a lot and just keep going and think about it all the time. And that's probably more toward the anxious attachment style. But that's okay still, right? It's, it's all okay. Yeah, it's just like we got to deal with what we have. And then once, once it's, we understand, it's just a lot easier to move forward. Like, oh, I, I make sense. Okay, that's why I do this. All right, now what? And then we can take responsibility in a, in a grown-up conscious way for our current relationships. I love it. And I like how you really you said it here in this interview. And you also said it in the book that there's no good or bad in the type of attachment style you have. It's just what you have. And so, um, you know, you don't have to judge it just if assertiveness is a problem for you, and you want to change it, just, you know, follow the guidelines in the book, and it'll change, it'll get better. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to shift and kind of manage that attachment style in a, um, in a way that gets you what you want. Like I think people, especially women should have what they want in life. 
and have their needs met. You know, so that's that's my hope with the book. <laughs> I agree. You know, and we all need, we all deserve to have our needs met. And I know for so many people, it's just a foreign concept. I've definitely talked to many, many people who have literally said when I ask, you know. How did you get your emotional needs met? They will say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. It's because emotionally they don't have a memory of that experience. Right, right. And that, Laura, that ties in that to the point that these attachment styles are ways that we adapt as children in an, in an attempt to stay close to the people we love and need to take care of us. Right. So they're, they're, they're adapt, you know, they're the way that we adapted to try and maintain the relationship. So they've served us, you know, they, all the styles serve us from what, wherever we came from. And then, uh, I think that's really important to, to understand too. Yeah, exactly. It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's just how you got your needs met then. Mm -hmm. So since this is the assertiveness guide for women, um, can you talk about kind of how things are a little bit different for women? I mean, you touched on this in the beginning of this conversation, but, you know, what is it that makes it harder for women in our culture to ask for what they need and to, even, to speak up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it is frequently as, as women, I mean, women and men, but I think particularly women, we frame things as individual weakness. So, oh, I need to be more assertive. I just need to speak up. What's wrong with me? How come I can't? It, it, we tend to frame it that way. And in, in one of the chapters, I talk about this kind of the larger societal context mm -hmm. that we women have been taught for years to be silent. We, you know, we've only been able to vote for what, approximately 100 years in this in America. So it's like our our voices literally have been silenced and that is not an individual experience. Like we have inherited that. That's been passed down that women's voices don't matter. That our job is only to support other people. And so I think that's important to keep in mind that that we're all trying to shift a, a much bigger uh, cultural issue than just our own personal struggles. Yeah, it depathologizes it a bit. Right, right. And we're socialized to, to take care of others, to be aware of the needs of others. And I love that part of being a woman. Like, I love that I'm tuned into other people. And if it's not balanced, again, with that, indi that individual sense of self, then, you know, <laughs> it's hard to be assertive because you don't know what you, you know, you don't know yourself. Right. And just because we're socialized and we have nurturing qualities to our, you know, maybe, maybe it's partly inherent for women to be nurturing since we give birth, um, that taking care of people is great but it doesn't mean you don't have your own needs. Right. You're a person too. <laughs> but right. Exactly. You're, you're, I, and I like to say, include yourself in your circle of care. You can't draw yourself out of that circle. Like you, you have to be in that circle of people that you care about and you take care of. Yeah. And I think that can be really a lot more profound than it seems because I don't think we realize sometimes all the ways that we're neglecting our own needs in the service of taking care of other people. And that is everything from in motherhood and mm. being a child and like taking care of your parents' emotional needs sometimes, even when you're still a child. Mm -hmm. And then in relationships, taking care of your partner's needs, but as therapists too, those of us who right. are therapists, you know? <laughs> We're caregivers all the way around, right? That's right. It never stops. Mm -hmm. 
And I often see that when I talk to therapists that they have a family member who they are always there for that person. And, you know, maybe an a chronically ill person in their family or someone who um, gets in trouble a lot, and they're always kind of taking care of them and bailing them out. And you know, I mean, that's, that's lovely and very caring and wonderful. But it really can be depleting when you are neglecting your own care. Right. Yeah. Amen. Well, I think this book is, like I said, I'm going to be purchasing several copies to give out to people I know and recommending it to many, many people, for sure. Oh, thank you. Well, you're welcome. I'm so glad you wrote it. And how can people find out more about what you're doing and about this book and all that stuff? Yeah, so my, my hub on the web is drjuliehanks.com. Okay. Uh, and the the website, there's a specific website address for the book information, and that's assertivenessguide.com. You can also download a free chapter if you go to assertivenessguide.com, and you can kind of get a feel for it. Uh, I There's a video on that page. It's me kind of explaining what the book's about and, and why I wrote it. Free chapter. Awesome. <laughs> So they can test it out. They don't have to just go buy it. They can test it out, fall in love, and then buy it. Right, exactly. Or or not buy it, whatever. You know, <laughs> like, if you think it's helpful, buy it. If you don't, that's okay, too. Because <laughs> it doesn't, it's not going to appeal to everybody. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, hopefully it'll it'll help someone. Oh, yeah. Well, I can already tell you it's helped me. And by me reading it, it's going to help a lot of people I know. Oh, I hope so. That's my, that's my goal. Well, Dr. Julie Hanks, it's been a pleasure to have you on therapy chat today. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me, Laura. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show for you therapy chat listeners, audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30 day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. The book that I got with my first audible trial is Playing Big by Tara Moore. That is a really good book about how women don't often speak up in the workplace and overcoming that. It connects well with Julie's book that we were talking about today, although they're very different. I highly recommend both. I hope you'll check out the Audible free trial available at www.audible.com slash therapy chat. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Julie Hanks about her book, The Assertiveness Guide for Women. I really love that book and I'm going to order several copies because understanding how to figure out what you need so you can ask for what you need, I think is crucial. And the way she uses attachment theory to explain how hard this can be for us as women and for anyone, I think is just fantastic. I highly recommend this book. As always, I'd love to hear your feedback about this episode. You can email me at laura at lauraregan.lcswc.com or send me a message through my website. I'd love to know what you like, what you don't like about Therapy Chat, what you'd like to hear more of, what you'd like to hear less of, questions you may want me to answer on Therapy Chat. Please share your thoughts with me and I will read every message and Maybe you'll hear your question addressed on the podcast. Also, please remember to go visit iTunes and leave a rating and review and subscribe so you can receive all the latest episodes as soon as they are released. And if you're a therapist, please stay tuned to listen to a description of my new trauma therapist community that I created. I talk about why I felt this was needed, what was missing for me that made me want to create this, and how you can join. As always, thanks so much for listening to Therapy Chat. Hi, I'm Laura Reagan. I'm an LCSWC, independently licensed social worker in Maryland, and I practice outside of Baltimore working with survivors of trauma. My particular practice is focused on working with people who have experienced childhood trauma, usually related to physical, sexual, or emotional abuse and neglect. I'm extremely passionate about my work, and you've probably heard me talk about it on my podcast, Therapy Chat. 
Over the now 14 years that I've been working with survivors of trauma, starting in 2002 when I was a volunteer with the Sexual Assault Crisis Center, I've come to discover that this is extremely rewarding work. It's so valuable and important. And at the same time, I say this to clients all the time, trauma is disconnection. What that means to me is when you've experienced trauma, it affects you. And we as therapists who work with survivors of trauma are also affected by hearing traumatic stories. We're witnessing with our clients what they've been through. And it is a beautiful, sacred privilege to be able to witness people's most terrifying and horrifying moments of their lives as told in therapy sessions. It's something I want to continue to do for the next 40 years. At the same time, for my clients, trauma is disconnection. They feel disconnected from themselves. They feel disconnected in their relationships. And our work together helps them get connected back with themselves so they can be more connected in relationships. We trauma therapists can often feel the same way. We become disconnected from ourselves. That means we're not taking care of ourselves the way we need to so we can be well and continue to do our work for years to come, not to mention just having a wonderful, fulfilling, meaningful life filled with rich, loving, deep relationships. Oftentimes, trauma therapists find that we feel isolated. We don't feel connected with our coworkers, our supervisors. Sometimes the only people we feel connected with are our clients. So realizing that and having experienced it myself off and on throughout the 14 years I've done this work, I decided to create a trauma therapist community. I did this because I realized it was something that I was looking for. And it's kind of hard to explain what it is because it's different from anything else I've seen. I hope maybe that it isn't the only group like this, but it's the only one I know of. So the trauma therapist community is groups online and in person. In person groups are for people who live in the local area and can travel to my office in Severna Park, Maryland. And online groups are for people anywhere. I'm calling them clinical consultation groups and they are, but the focus of these groups is the effects of doing this work on us as therapists. Identifying the effects, preventing the effects, using strategies, supporting one another to overcome the effects of secondary traumatic stress or exposure to trauma through our work because we're trying to prevent burnout. So this community includes a private secret Facebook group only for members It's time limited so we can have a container and I may change that because if people really like it and feel that it's of value, then we may want to keep it open. But for the initial launch of this trauma therapist community, it begins in September 2016 and continues through January 2017. At that time, I'll see how the response has been and I may reopen it or modify what I'm offering. But for now, this will be a community where we can gather on Facebook and we have space for clinical consultation. The groups will be divided into newer and more experienced clinicians because I know that clinicians who have been working with trauma survivors for 20 years may feel their needs aren't being met if they're in a group with people who've just started and have more questions about trauma therapy skills and presentations. So I want to make it a space where everyone feels their needs are being met. We're supporting one another. You may be listening to this and thinking, is this for me? I'm not sure. So I kind of thought about some characteristics of someone who would benefit from this. And this is what I came up with. You might feel discouraged, but you're still hopeful. You're open to being creative and considering new ideas. You're passionate about helping your clients. You may not be the greatest at taking care of yourself and you want to get better at that. You like to learn. You love talking about our work. You want a space where you can share clinical information, but the main thing you need is community. If this sounds like you, please visit www.lauraregan.lcswc.com slash join 
or go to that website and click on Trauma Therapist Community. I welcome you and I would love to have you there. And remember, please visit iTunes to subscribe, leave a rating and review, and download episodes. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, visit Laura's website at www.lauraregan.lcswc.com.